Hello everybody and welcome into the Apples and Genos Fantasy Hockey Podcast. My name is Nate Groot Nibblink and I will be your host. Today I'm coming to you with a quick little solo bonus episode, I guess you could call it, talking a little bit about keepers, keeper strategy. This all came out of a question that I had in the Apples and Genos Discord server. If you're not already in the Apples and Genos Discord server, link is in the description. Absolutely should be in there. We're talking keeper strategy and prospects and all sorts of things in there all off-season long. should definitely come and check that out. Uh, yeah, in this episode, I'm really just going to be talking about some thoughts that I had about this specific question that came up in the Discord from one of the Discord members, a new member, and just some general things to think about when evaluating your own keeper decisions in your leagues, which I'm sure we'll all be obsessing over all off season long as we anxiously await the return of fantasy hockey this September. So right off the top, I'm just going to talk really briefly about keeper formats just so we're all on the same page to get things started a lot of keeper leagues um, start with how many players you're keeping right are you able to keep three players some keeper leagues you really don't have a restriction you can keep one player you can keep up to six players you know you don't have to keep six players but you can keep up to six players you can keep four or five six players so there are a lot of different rules around the number of players, but usually that's where things start. People, You'll hear, hear people talk about a keep three, a keep four league, a keep ten league, uh, whatever the case may be. That's usually just talking about the number of players that they're keeping from year to year, keeping on their roster year after year um, on their teams. So a lot of keeper leagues will have a position restriction where, you know, you have to keep one goalie or you have to keep three forwards or you have to keep two defensemen each year or something to that effect. So that's another consideration in some leagues. And a lot of leagues, they have a little bit more of an involved keeper setup where you keep a player in a certain round. So it replaces your draft pick in next year's draft for a certain round based on where you took them in last year's draft or whether you just picked them up off waivers. So, for example, a pretty common one that I've seen is you can keep a player from last year's draft plus one draft round. So if you took somebody in the 10th round, you can keep them in the 9th round uh, in your upcoming draft. And then a lot of times uh, leagues like that and other keeper leagues as well will have some sort of timeout restriction. You know, you can only keep a player for one year or you can only keep uh, any single player for up to three years or something like that, just so that uh, people are not keeping... Uh, Connor McDavid on their team for the entire length of the league's duration. So a lot of times you'll run into things like that. Uh, basically, those are the kind of major format things that you can think about with keeper leagues. There are plenty of others. There are tons of different keeper rules that I've run into, some a little bit more outlandish than others. But those are a lot of the basics around keeper leagues, a lot of the basic formats that people are using when they're forming these keeper leagues. It's a very fun format, gives you a little bit of extra strategy to play with, a little bit to think about in the season. You can, you know, trade in a lot of cases, you can trade your future year's picks and try to load up for a particular year for a title run. So that element is pretty exciting. It's not as involved as a true dynasty league where you keep all of the players on your roster year after year after year, um, but you keep a certain number and then you're able to trade some of your next year's draft picks in the current year to try to maximize your chances of winning for that year. So just a lot of excitement around keeper leagues and this time in the off season is when we're all looking at our keeper leagues and wondering what are we going to do with these keeper decisions which players are we going to keep how do we evaluate these decisions so as i mentioned this came up for me based on a keeper question that came up in the discord from a new member in there it's pretty involved, uh, but, you know, it is the fantasy hockey off season, so I had the time, and uh, I wanted to have some sort of episode about some keeper strategy elements in here, too, so I thought this was a pretty solid example to go through and think about, help you think about some of these decisions and what factors should really be influencing the decision. So in this particular example that we're going to go through, it's a 15-team season-long points league. So it's not a head-to-head -head league. It's a roto league, basically 
players score points throughout the season and they add up the total number of points at the end of the season. Whoever has scored the most points uh, gets the trophy, gets the championship. So um, in this particular setup, a goal is worth a point, an assist is also worth one point, and a hat trick is also worth one point. Hits and shots are worth 0 0.05 points. So right off the top, you have goals and assists worth the same amount. So you really have no bonus for the heavy shooters, the heavy scorers, like an Austin Matthews, like a David Pasternak. Players of this ilk are not really any better than the Mitch Marners, uh, the heavy setup men uh, in this kind of setup, right? The 0 0.05 points for hits and shots is not very significant it's a very it's 1 20th of a of a goal or an assist 1 20th of a point is a hit and a shot so it's a very very small um, kind of percentage usually i say as a basic rule of thumb anything more than 1 10th uh, for any peripheral category, anything that's not a point, uh, anything more than one tenth of a goal is probably something that you should really take note of, and anything less than that is probably not going to majorly influence your decision making in terms of draft picks or in terms of trades or waiver wire pickups. But in this case, you have a situation where it's one twentieth, so it's literally half of what I would consider a threshold for it to be a big time uh, influencer in your decision making. So it's very much not a major factor in my decision making for anything in this particular instance. For goalies, you have a win equal to two points, so double what a goal is. You have uh, it was written in as L or OT equals one point. So I'm going to assume that's a shootout loss or an OT loss is equal to one point. Shutouts are two points as well saves are 0 0.05 points so again you take 40 saves to equal a win so wins are very important for goalies uh, so that is a little bit more predictable um, there's not a penalty for goals against so you don't really have the uh, necessity of a goalie playing well for in order for them to score a lot of points you're just looking for them to play on a good team basically get lots of wins and ideally they get a bunch of saves along with that for the bonus points but wins definitely the most important thing there. Uh, so in this particular one, it is a keep seven. So they're keeping seven players. There's no position limits, no thing about, uh, you know, whatever round they took them in last year, they keep them around earlier. It's just keep whatever seven players you want, your best seven players, uh, keep them year after year. The one uh, caveat to that is they do have a timeout, so you can't keep any one player more than three years. They can play three seasons for your team, and then they have to be put back in the pool. So uh, the rosters here, 12 forwards, so no distinction for center, left wing, right wing. 12 forwards, 6 defensemen, 2 goalies, and then 10 bench. On that bench, you have to have a minimum of 1 goalie, 2 D, 3 forwards. Uh, probably shouldn't have any issue doing any of that. The team that this player has, this manager has, is both the Chuck brothers, Matthew and Brady, JT Miller, Alexander Barkov, Joe Pavelski, Valerie Nachushkin, Matt Zuccarello, Braden Shen, Andre Kuzmenko, Jake DeBrusque, Travis Konechny, Nick Schmaltz, Vinny Trocek, Tom Wilson, David Krejci, Andre Palat, and Boone Jenner. So you know this is a Blake-approved squad with both Vinny Tro and Boone Jenner. Uh, just the charisma and the uh, stunning good looks per 60 on this team is through the roof. So you have that going for it. The defensemen are Kale McCarr, Josh Morrissey, Moritz Sider, Chris Letang, Cam Fowler, Alex Petrangelo, Bowen Byram, Adam Boakvist, and Vince Dunn. And then the goalies are Thatcher Demko, Vili Husso, Phoenix Copley, and Uko Pekka Lukanen. So as I mentioned, you can't keep any single player more than three years. This particular manager has already kept the Tachucks, JT Miller, Kale McCarr, Mart Sider, and Thatcher Demko for the previous season. So they're already going into their second season on this roster if they were to be kept again. Uh, this is where it gets a little interesting. So this manager won actually the entire league this past year. But in order to do that, they sold everything for rounds one through six in the upcoming draft, including actually rounds three and six in 2024. So they dipped into 2024 as well to get the big W, the big ship for this year. That's what we like to see. Big advocate for selling it all, going all in. Uh, you love to see it. As long as you come home with the chip, everything's worth it in the end. So 
you're in a context where this manager uh, in the messages in the Discord is pretty uh, pretty much set on that this would be a rebuild year, uh, having given away all those picks in order to secure the championship this past year. Looking at a rebuild year, wondering what to do with these keeper decisions. So they had an idea in their post about what their seven keepers would be. Um, in my mind, I'm just going to run through what I would be doing. So I'm not going to go through what their thoughts were. I'm just going to give my thoughts um, straight off the hip here. In my mind, both the Chucks, Alexander Barkov, JT Miller, and Kale McCarr are all locks. So that's five locks out of the seven off the top. Uh, I don't think I really need to delve into that too much. All of these players have shown really, really good um, potential to score really, really well. Brady Tuchuk, obviously the one who scores the least points of this group, but actually one who the hits will come in very, very good uh, use in this league. Even though the the uh, ratio is not that big in relative to points, for when you're throwing 300 plus hits and 300 plus shots like Brady Tuchuk is every single year, it does add up after a while. And, you know, if you think of him as maybe somewhere around a 75 point player to a point per game player, plus add in those hits and those shots, you can see why Brady Tuchuk is a very valuable player to keep. So those are the five locks, in my opinion. I don't think you can really make an argument against any of those players. But that leaves, obviously, some pretty big decisions for the final two spots. In my mind, those final few spots are between four players, I would say. Josh Morrissey, Chris Letang, Vince Dunn, and Travis Konechny. I'm definitely not interested in keeping a goalie. I know it's a 15-team league, and so you might be thinking, you know, you have to have a goalie. But the only goalie I'd be even remotely considering keeping uh, would be Thatcher Demko. And this is, Demko's a goalie you've already kept for a season, so he's going into year two. And if you're thinking about a rebuild, you're thinking that this might be a pretty tough year, then you're already not even betting on Demko's upcoming season, but you're betting a season beyond that. And I'm not comfortable betting on any goalie's season for the upcoming year, let alone a season beyond that. I just can't can't possibly make that bet. We see the variance in goalies year to year. There's no way that I am considering taking or keeping a goalie here that you really not even truly betting on for this season. You're truly thinking about them for the season following. But I do think uh, that does bring up a pretty interesting question about whether you're actually back in for this season or rebuilding. I mentioned that this manager uh, was approaching it with the assumption that they would be rebuilding for this season. But one of the key points that I want to bring up and that really got me thinking about this particular format that this manager's in is the deeper the keeper system, so the more players that you're keeping, the easier it is to reload every single year and kind of keep up perennial contender status despite missing picks. So if you're keeping seven players on your team and those seven players are like legitimate stud level players and obviously this manager had many more than just seven and that's why you're faced with this decision here. But in a situation like this one where you're going to have seven very, very good players, players that unless something truly, truly ridiculous happened, you would expect would be very, very good fantasy contributors at the very least for the 2023-24 season. That's a pretty solid core. Like you really just have to work around that. You don't have to think too, too much about um, what you can fill in around that. So the one thing that is kind of counter to that with this specific team is that the depth of the league, the fact that it's a 15 team league, means that you know 15 times six rounds where you don't have any picks 90 players are going to come off the board before you have a pick again and that is a lot of players and uh 12 if this was a 12 team league that'd only be 72 right if it was a 10 team league it'd only be 60 players that are coming off the board before your seventh round pick comes up and so maybe in that situation you know and a keep seven, you're thinking, I actually, you know, I have a really, really solid keep seven group. And so I actually think that, you know, if I find a few hidden gems uh, later on, then I might not be leaning into this rebuild uh, quite so soon as I thought. 
the problem with this is that some of the players, you know, in that group of 90 that's going to come off before the seventh round hits, some of the players taken out in that range will absolutely explode for 80, 90 points. And you just miss out on even having that chance. You don't get a chance to to play your cards and to have a chance at that lottery. So that's just a a missed uh, opportunity. That's the opportunity cost of going all in in the previous season and taking home that championship. Now, at the same time, we know uh, just by looking at the sheer statistics that the caliber of player flattens out considerably after I would say somewhere around six to eight on average in your average redraft league. So plenty after seven keepers are kept by all 15 teams. When you get into this range, it's a very, very flat um, range in terms of the difference in scoring between a player uh, that's going to be selected in uh, what would amount to round eight. So the first round after all the keepers, uh, that player kept in, uh, that would be taken in round eight versus a player that's taken in, you know, even round like 13. In a lot of cases, there's going to be, you know, you would expect based on projections, maybe like a seven, maybe 10 point difference in projections between the players taken in round eight versus round 13 it's not a lot it's not a huge edge and if you're able to find players in those later rounds uh, where you finally do start picking again if you're able to find players in those rounds that are out producing like if you're able if you're pretty confident in projections if you're using the apples and genos projections and you're saying you know there's going to be guys that i know based on these projections and that my league is going to miss on and are going to be there for me even after i wait for those six rounds before i get my my first crack at the can here there might be a player in that round that you would have taken you know in one of the first rounds after um after the keepers come off. So all that to say, there's there's something to think about here. I wouldn't be all the way sold that this is a rebuild right away just yet. So another thing for consideration here is that you arguably only have one true elite on this team in Kale McCarr. The others that I'd put in that category, you know, McDavid, Dreisaitl, McKinnon, Kucherov, Matthews, to Chuck, Matthew to Chuck on this team, borderline, in my opinion. You know, he's done it. Um, I don't know if I'm really ready to say that to Chuck is absolutely a, you know, 110 plus point player um, year in, year out, the way that we think the some of the other guys that I mentioned there are. So you have borderline player there, but you have one true elite in Makar. If you had several true elites, you know, if you had, you know, McDavid and McCarr, then you know you're in a really, really, really good spot in that point, especially in a 15-team league. You have a significant advantage with two true elites. In this case, you have one significant advantage over a lot of the league in McCarr. Tuchuk is a really good player, um, probably a first-round pick, so probably better than some other team's best players, right? But that's not the teams you're actually contending with if you're looking at loading up for another title. You're contending probably with the McDavid team, and does that McDavid team also have Matthews or something like that, right? So these are the kinds of things that you you have to think about. Um, yeah, maybe the McDavid team ran into Tage Thompson and Jason Robertson uh, in this past season. They're going to have all those all those studs for next year, players that will probably in redraft this year be going in the late first, early second round in some cases. So those are really the teams that you have to be looking about, looking at and thinking about, do I have a chance to beat those teams? So in the end of all of this, I'm not sure that you really have to make a decision on this being a rebuild team or this being a, you know, go again for the, for the title once again this year. I don't know that you have to make that decision right now um, unless you're really... Uh, looking at trading some of these players uh, to other teams for picks, but in my mind, uh, if you can trade, you know, if you can trade Morrissey for and get some of those picks back, if someone's willing to trade you their pick, um, whatever the pick may be, honestly, like you're, if you're not keeping a player, or if you have, you know, I I mentioned four players I'd be interested in keeping. 
off this roster for those final two spots. If you can trade two of those players for pretty much anything, then that's a net win for you um, before the draft comes around, before your keepers are solidified. So think about that as well. If you do have that ability to trade in the offseason and you do have the ability to move off of the... Uh, the excess, I guess, that you would say players that may be keepers, uh, keeper level players for other teams, but aren't keeper level players for your team. So coming to the end of all of this, uh, I guess if I have to give a, a thought on the final two players, my current uh, leaning, I guess you would say, is Morrissey and Konechny. I think Konechny showed us something last year tend to believe it. I don't know that he's going to get the extreme amount of usage that I saw last year. Definitely he ran a little hot at times, but I do think that this is a player that you can probably say is going to be pretty valuable. He He's going to get a lot of minutes in Philadelphia, even if it's not quite as uh, insane as it was last year. He's still going to be one of their top players and get a ton of minutes. He should produce very well and should produce very well for a, a long time. So I do like Konechny there. I do think Morrissey is probably your next best bet. Um, probably a guy who's going to have really good trade value. You know, we have Rick Bonus coming back there who Morrissey flourished under this past year. I do think Morrissey had a lot of signs um, for regression this upcoming season, so I don't think that you can reasonably expect that he's going to have the same kind of season once again. But I do think that a lot of people are going to be interested in acquiring Morrissey. Uh, so maybe there's, uh, if you do have the ability to trade now, then maybe Morrissey is even a sell high and you could trade, you could uh, think about keeping somebody else from that list. Uh, really, Latang is the only player off there that if you keep Latang, then I think you're saying to yourself that you think you're back in for this season, right? Uh, because we don't know how many years Latang realistically has left at this high level of play. Uh, so that's kind of the calculus that I'm going through in my mind thinking about this team. Like I said, I'm not, I know that there's going to be some people that are pretty, uh, pretty much in disbelief that I wouldn't even consider uh, holding Demko in a 15 team league. I, I just really think that keepers in general, and maybe this is a good place to end it, keepers in general are a thesis. The thesis of keepers should be. How can I build the safest floor for my team? That should be what we're trying to do in our redraft leagues with our top, you know, three, four, five rounds of picks. You want to not miss in those in those rounds more than you even want to hit above expectation. If you don't miss with your picks, if you don't give up a ton of value in your first four or five rounds of picks, then you're going to be in a good spot because there are going to be teams in your league that do miss with those first, uh, first like even in the first round, some people will probably miss. So if you can avoid those misses, if you can make smart, informed decisions, listen to Apples and Genos uh, and make some smart and informed decisions about who your top players are then you're setting yourself up in a really good spot when you go to a goalie as one of your keepers when you go to a goalie in the early rounds of your redraft leagues then you're just inviting a ton of variants yes it could go very well but it could also go horrifically horrifically wrong as we saw with Demko this past season right and many other goalies along the way so that's the reason that I'm really not interested in goalies in almost any keeper format. Uh, definitely not in this format when you have such terrific options to think about in terms of Morrissey and Latang and uh, Dunn. Uh, Dunn is another name where I think uh, probably was over his skis last year, but I could be convinced that Dunn could possibly have a better season than Morrissey this upcoming year again. We'll see once my projections come out exactly where I land on that, but... Um, yeah, still lots to be told uh, in both those situations, what they do in the off season, if they add any firepower to those uh, units, if the Winnipeg Jets blow up all of their, their entire team and suddenly it looks like the offensive cupboard is pretty bare in Winnipeg, maybe that knocks Morrissey down for me. So lots of things still to come, but in my current state, uh, I think I would not be interested in... Uh, Demko for sure, and I would lean towards Josh Morrissey and Travis Konechny as those final two spots. 
That's going to be all that I've got for this episode. Hopefully it brought you some value, helped you get a little bit better at fantasy hockey today. Many thanks to the band there there for the music for this podcast. Be sure to check out their Spotify as well. And that's it, folks. Much love.